Coming up in episode 219, I'll tell you how I jumped the turnstiles at a SEPTA regional rail stop to help my friends get from the station over to our Keystone chapter meeting. I'll also tell you about a couple of audio description stories, one having to do with a film at a museum and one having to do with live theater. I've also got a pretty funny Ziggy story as well. From Studio B in Swarthmore, this is the I Can't See You podcast with David. It's like blind people for dummies. Hello there, and welcome to episode 219 of I Can't See You. My name is David, at David Benj on all the socials. I really do appreciate you joining me for today's episode, and as mentioned, I've got a few things to talk about. I'm going to hold the turnstile story and start off with the audio description, though. There were a couple of times this week that audio description, and believe me, audio description always comes into discussions with my blind friends or even when I'm watching something And for example, today, and I'm recording this late because of everything that was going on this week, it's Saturday afternoon, I was watching this week's episode of The Rookie, and there were some subtitles. I was watching on my own, had no idea what they were saying, it wasn't described, so I just missed that part of the show. And so it's audio description is always front and center for blind folks, And twice this week, two different times, we've had some things going on, both of them very positive. And I'm going to start off with a phone call or a meeting, a Zoom meeting, I guess, the other day, which had to do with live theater. And this is so outstanding that these theaters, these local theaters in the Philadelphia area, the Wilma Theater, Hedro Theater, which is very close to me, it's in Rose Valley, it's probably a 10-minute ride from my house, and a bunch of other theaters in the area. There were some more in Philadelphia. And because I wasn't the one that got the email, the email that came around didn't show everybody from all the different places they were going to be from. They're interested in learning from blind and visually impaired folks what they can do so that they can do audio description and they can all be on the same page as far as the devices they're going to use and everything else. So it was very cool that they took the initiative to do that, and that part is outstanding. The other part is outstanding, too, and I'll get to that in a minute, the other thing I want to talk about with audio description. But there were, I don't know how many people on the call, blind and visually impaired folks. There were four or so people from the different theaters. I think it was four. And there were probably six or seven of us blind and visually impaired folks on the call, and A lot of people had a lot of great ideas. The one thing for me, they're all wondering what devices should we use. The issue that I've always found going to the movies, they always give you the wrong device. Other people have had trouble with the devices themselves. They're not charged or they don't work for whatever reason and nobody there knows how to operate them. And that's what uh, one of the folks on the Zoom call said that, You know, a lot of times he'll go and he'll get the device and everything will be right, but then it won't work and they can't figure it out because it's a device that they've not seen before and they don't know how to use it, meaning meaning, uh, the person who is trying to watch the play or the movie or whatever. So my thing, and I found this out when I was in Washington at Washington Seminar the night that I went to Charlene's Bar and Grill with a few folks from Greater Philly Chapter and some folks from a couple other states. Denise Brown, who goes to a lot of theater, said a lot of places in New York will use your iPhone and you get an app. And then once the event starts, you'll you open the app and everything takes over from there. It's pretty pretty good. Now, I've also heard that Some of those are automated, and sometimes the cues are missed. For example, if there's a lighting change or something like that, and that's supposed to trigger an audio-described segment, sometimes that gets missed for whatever reason. But to me, using your own device is the best solution. And a couple of folks on the call said, yes, that's true. However, a lot of people or many people can't afford a smartphone that could use that device. And I understand that. 
the problem I have using something else, and a few people also said this, I don't want to go to a theater or the movies or wherever and be handed a device that you don't know if it's clean. And somebody suggested make sure you always carry Lysol wipes. But especially now, between COVID and everything else, I don't want to. I don't want to put something on my head. And and even back in the day, I remember, even before we had salon supplies and interiors, where there was, <laughs> I don't want to say it. Thankfully, lice outbreaks in the schools because people were just coming in. It was a revolving door into salon supplies and interiors for people trying to get this stuff to take care of the lice. I remember back in the day being told, oh, when you go into a music store, remember those? Tower Records, remember? Going into a music store, don't use the headsets that are there because they could have lice on them or other things. So it's not a new thing not wanting to use some sort of device that who knows <laughs> whose head it was on previously and how it's been cleaned and if it's clean and everything else. So to me, using your own device or if they're going to provide a device, make it that, and this is where if you're an iPhone user, you kind of get hosed because a lot of them will have the three and a half inch or 3.5 millimeter jack that you can just plug regular earbuds into regular earbuds not apple earbuds because nobody has a nobody's putting a lightning port on the side of their um recorder that that came from the library for the blind it's a three and a half millimeter plug and boom that's that's what you get so you got to either bring the dongle or you've got to get another set of earbuds and i think i've talked about this before the same issue is true if you want to use an atm machine and (laughs) And for those of you in the Philadelphia area, I almost called it a Mac machine. That's what it was called by one of the banks around here. And then they became, they all kind of merged and it was a network. Uh, That wasn't the first one in the Philadelphia area. George, I think, was the first one by a bank called Gerard Bank. Mac stood for Money Access Center. But that was the ATM in the Philadelphia area. Down in Florida, I also thought it was funny. (laughs) The, The ATM was called Quick and Easy. So everybody always made funny comments about that as well. So if you have if you have a device that has a regular plug on the end, you can go to the ATM and plug in to most of them now so you can hear the transaction and actually use the ATM. If you <laughs> if you've left the home only with your earbuds and your iPhone, well, you're out of luck. So that was another option using a device that has the capabilities of using your own earbuds. I don't care if I'm holding on to a device in my hand as long as the earbuds that are going into my ears are only my earbuds and nobody else has <laughs> stuck them in their ears. So it was awesome that these theaters got together and are so interested in helping blind and visually impaired folks enjoy going to the theater. I can't tell you the last time I've gone to the theater, and it's funny because I know uh, Phantom of the Opera is closing soon. That may be... The last time I was at a professional theater, I know I probably went to some plays at the kids' schools, and uh, I definitely know I was when Jane did a couple of productions when she was a junior or a senior uh, at Friends Central. She wasn't in the play. She was costumes for one, and she did something else for another, I believe. She'll have to correct me, and if she's listening, I know I'll hear it. (laughs) So it's awesome that they want to do that and that they are taking the initiative. It's not like they were sued and somebody said, hey, you got to do this, you got to do that. That part is great. And now the key is to just following through. And it really seems like they're very interested. This was the second of two calls that they were doing for it because I guess some folks didn't get the message about this happening. I didn't find out about it until maybe four or five days before Uh, Harriet, the president of the Keystone chapter, had called and asked if I would be interested. And I'm always interested in stuff like that. That's something that I'm always excited to do because I want blind folks to be able to go to things like that. So the other thing, the other audio description thing, and this is all tied together. That's why you're not hearing any of those cool stingers in between. The other audio description is from the Museum of the American Revolution. Again, these folks are at the front of the line when it comes to wanting to help blind and visually impaired folks enjoy the museum when they go. And they've already done a lot of stuff, but now they are describing 
the movies or films, I, can you call them that? They're shorts. I, the one was 15 minutes. So they've been asking, and we did the first one, we kind of gave feedback. The reason that I've heard it, and I was hoping to play a clip of it in Just Listen. When I asked, I, was, I had to wait for somebody else to get back to me. I talked to the guy who was in charge. His name is Tyler, and he deferred to somebody named Alex. And I didn't hear from Alex by the time I had to publish this, so I'm going without it. And it's a shame because I, <laughs> I copied the um, – using Audio Hijack, I got the audio version of the, the movie. And I was sent the whole movie. And again, it's 14 minutes, 47 seconds long not not even a whole TV show. It's a film, whatever you want to call it, a short. Let's call it a short. So I had actually sent it to Lisa because Lisa is not part of the quote-unquote vision council that we have to give feedback on stuff like this and from Penn Museum and from University of the Arts and some other places that, that we help out. So I wanted to get her take on it because, quite frankly, I thought the audio description was horrible. Horrible. And when I conveyed that message to Trish Maunder, she said, there's not many audio describers in the Philadelphia area. And I couldn't believe that. When I heard that, when I got off the phone with her, I immediately texted Lisa and I told her, hey, listen, I was just talking to Trish. And there's not many audio describers in this area. You got to figure out how to do it because you will easily get work because she's better than this girl. Lisa is better than the girl who did Revolution is the name of the movie and who the Museum of the American Revolution is contracted to do both that movie, film, short, whatever, and another one that we're going to be reviewing and giving feedback on on Monday night. And again, it's Saturday afternoon. Monday night is President's Day or Washington's birthday because it wasn't officially changed by Congress. Go ahead, look it up. And she's also going to be, this audio describer is also going to be doing a described tour of the museum so you can go through the museum with this recording. And again, I'm not sure how they're going to deliver it. You can go through the museum and have whatever is behind the glass or what's in front of you, the painting and things like that. There's a huge painting as you go up the stairs at the top of the stairs of the museum. And it's George Washington, General Rochambeau of France, and a few other folks. And they're, they're, it's an encampment. And it's just a big part of the entrance to the actual museum, the, the second floor of the museum. And that's where all of the things are that you really want to see. There's a, <laughs> there's a uh, gift shop downstairs and a cafe and things like that. And there's a couple of things, a couple of other things. But for the most part, everything is upstairs. And this is what welcomes you at the top of the stairs is this picture of Washington and the others. This person who's doing the describing, first of all, in the short called Revolution, it sounded like she was whispering. It sounded like, hey, you're going to be doing audio description for this movie. And she thought, okay, well, you know what? When I go to the movies or when I go to something and I describe it for my blind or visually impaired friend, I whisper. This is really what it sounded like. White text appears on the screen, and it says, blah, blah, blah. It didn't actually say blah, 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 but you get the idea. It was like she was whispering to us. And with audio, and it, it really sounded like she had never listened to anything that was audio described before in her life. And again, it was horrible, but this person is making some money because she is one of only a couple of people in the city of Philadelphia that do it. And so Lisa and I, we actually did an interview yesterday for White Canes Connect for an upcoming episode, episode 62. Uh, We had Paul Howard and Chris Crawley on to finish our Black History Month episodes. And we talked a little bit about it then, and we texted about it later, and I said, you got to figure it out so you can do it, and you, you'll make money because you're better than this other person. So hopefully she will do it. I'm also, I am excited, though, by the Museum of the American Revolution even doing the description. And Trish shared with me, because I wasn't able to go to the meeting when we talked about the AD track to do the feedback – 
and I just submitted mine to Trish, she was telling me some of the things other people said during the meeting, the other the other visually impaired and blind folks. And as well, I'm going to mention a few things that a few folks on the call said about the theater. And less is usually more in my book. And that's what a lot of people said. Now, some people said they wanted to know background information. I only want to know what the sighted people know. I don't need to know, for example, about the hoisin sauce in Crazy Rich Asians. I just needed to know she's pouring sauce on her food. That's all I needed. It's not important what kind it was. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I did that stand-up and I saw a blind stand-up comedian (laughs) talk about why is it so important that I knew that the character had a green shirt on? And just like me with the hoisin sauce and thinking, oh, well, if they're telling me that it's hoisin sauce, it must have a part in the plot that I need to remember. The comedian said, does the green shirt play a role in the plot? And of course it didn't. So I only want the information that a sighted person can get from watching the screen. If it's a portrait of a person, say it's a portrait of Thomas Jefferson. That's all. I don't need to know what he was wearing. I know he's not naked. I know kind of what he looks like. And I know the the getup from what folks wore back in the day during that time period. I don't need to know a... It's not a fashion, unless it's a fashion, <laughs> unless it's a fashion thing, I don't need to know. I just need to know it's a portrait of Thomas Jefferson. That's all. If it's a portrait of, and I can't remember his name, there is a Native American, and his name is Joseph something, and his name is so not Native American-like that I didn't realize <laughs> that he was actually Native American. And they have a quote from him. I don't need to know. Now, it would have been helpful to know that he was from one of the tribes. And I don't think it mentioned that. Because when they mentioned his name, I didn't know. I didn't know that he was Native American. So that was one thing that folks said. And and I disagree with that. Again, I only want the information that the sighted folks can get. If you can look at a picture and give me Thomas Jefferson's whole backstory, that's great, great for you. But Does it play a role in the rest of this short? Probably not. On that same level, people wanted to know who made the short and all the different things like that. There are no credits at the end of the short. If there's no credits at the end, I want to be as in the dark as my sighted counterparts about knowing who made that film. If it's not on the screen, I don't want to hear it in my ears. And on the theater side, somebody had mentioned that when there is a dance scene in a show, you don't really need to talk about that. You can just listen to the music and know that they're dancing. I need a little more information. This person has been to a lot of productions and several times to a few of them. So they know that this is what happens and here's what it is because they've been there enough and there's, oh, this is the dance scene where this, that, and the other happen. I don't know that because this is my first time and anybody else who's going for the first time may need a little bit of background on it. What's happening? They're dressed like this or they're dressed like that. But again, I don't need to know a whole bunch more. I don't need to know the backstory and everybody who's out there. You can tell me who the people are there if it's important. Otherwise, if it's a main character, you can say the main character and some others are dancing. That's all. And unless the fashion (laughs) plays a role in the whole plot, it doesn't matter. And it's funny because there's been a lot of talk lately about people wanting to know when somebody is at a podium speaking, they want to know what's the person look like. Is it a guy or is it a girl? What are they wearing? And I'm getting a little tired of it because if you're a sighted person and you look at somebody who's coming up to the podium and they look like a hobo, but they are the smartest person on earth, you're going to discount the words that come out of that person's mouth when you see them walking up to the podium. I want to hear what they have to say. And if they're crazy, I'll make that judgment. 
And if they're as smart as can be, I'll make that judgment too. I don't need to know what they're wearing. I don't need to know their pronouns. I don't need to know what they identify as or what they actually are. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. Just let's hear from the person speaking. And the same thing goes with audio description. I don't need the whole, I think he's got white underwear on. I can't tell if they're boxers or briefs. And then he's got jeans and a black belt with a big belt buckle that says, (laughs) whatever. Sorry, I'm getting too far (laughs) into it. And I would love to do audio description or any kind of voiceover work, by the way, but I cannot do it in a way that would make it timely and where it wouldn't take me all day to do a 10-minute project. Uh, But I would love to do that. And maybe one day when I have a minute, and as somebody said watching the Super Bowl, when did Andy Reid, and it was my friend Jim, when did Andy Reid learn time management? Because he did a great job (laughs) during the Super Bowl. He could never do it during his time with the Eagles, never. So um, once I learn time management, maybe I'll have some time to practice it. I too can do audio description in the Philadelphia area because I'm telling you, I know I could do a better job than the person that did and was contracted by the Museum of the American Revolution. And if you listen, you're the person doing that audio description and you want to come on, I would gladly have you on, whether you call the number 646-926-6350 or actually come on to an an entire episode. And we can go back and forth and you can tell me how great you are and I can tell you that I disagree. So I know you've probably been waiting because you see the title (laughs) about jumping the turnstiles and you think, man, it's just like in Cops and you can hear the song Bad Boys playing. And again, I'm not going to play that because I'm a a little wuss about the copyright stuff. So I'm not going to, not going to do it. I'd love to though. So each month on the second Saturday of the month, we have a Keystone Chapter meeting. And the Keystone Chapter is part of the National Federation of the Blind of Pennsylvania, in case you're a first-time listener. And we meet at the Penn Museum. And fortunately for us there, well, fortunately for me and the other folks who take SEPTA regional rails, there's a station about a five-minute walk from the Penn Museum. And it's awesome that it's that close. It's not as convenient if you're coming via another mode of public transportation. If you're taking a trolley, it's a few blocks away. If you're taking a bus, you could get there by bus, but you got to change and more than likely. But if you take the regional rails, and again, SEPTA is the mass transportation company in southeastern Pennsylvania. In fact, it literally stands for Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. The way it usually works for me, people during the week will call me and say, hey, could you help me get from the station to the museum? And I love doing that. It's one of my favorite things to do. I get a bunch of steps in, and I help these folks out. And I love doing it. And it also gets me from some of the things that I've already heard, for example, the presidential release. I usually hear that at another time. And that's a 20-minute or 30-minute part of our meeting. It's where the president of the National Federation of the Blind talks about what's coming up and we're doing this and we're doing that and this and that and the other. So if I'm out doing all those things, helping these folks get to the museum, to our meeting, then I don't have to listen to it again. And usually the way it works, of course, I get there and sometimes other people are there and I walk with them to the museum and then I walk back when the next person calls me and I go and I help them. The, the only issue I have is this street that we have to walk from the museum, I'm sorry, from the station to the museum, it's called, uh, I think it's Convention Avenue. It's not heavily traveled. So I can never tell when it's safe to cross. I can't hear cars going because there's not usually many cars. And because it's not a really big street, it's a, just a two-lane road, it's not, if, if you've got a hybrid or an electric vehicle, I don't know that I would hear you because it's not a a road that you're going to be going fast on. We're about a block in from South Street, and I can't tell a lot of times if cars are coming. Now, if I think it's safe, I will listen and look and try to use any vision I can to see if something's coming. But a lot of times, it's a leap of faith when I step off that curb. 
And so last Saturday, I got off the train and I was hoping that Cat was going to be at the station. I looked, I didn't see anyone. I texted someone who had texted me while I was on the train. And then I tapped around and then I left the station, hoping that if Cat was there, she would say, oh, I'm right over here. But again, didn't see her, didn't hear her, left, got across the, uh, texted, actually texted her before I left the station asking if she was there. I didn't get a response right away, so I went and I crossed the street. I went down the stairs from the station, crossed the street. When I got to the other side of the street that I hate to cross, I got a text from Kat saying that, yes, she was at the station. So I'm like, oh, brother. I went back across that dreaded street, up the stairs, and I get to the turnstile. And it used to be that the handicapped turnstile would just open automatically. You didn't have to tap in. Well, now you have to tap in. Okay, no big deal. I'm not going to get on the train, so it doesn't matter. I tap in. I walk down the stairs to the platform. I get cat. We walk up the stairs. I go to tap out. I can't tap out. I said to cat, all right, let's come down here to the handicap turnstile because it's wider, and I know that we can both go through it because it's a set of doors. It's not actually a turnstile. We go through... I get her across the street to the same spot I was, and I get a call from Jim. Jim says, we're at 30th Street Station. We'll be there in a minute. And I thought, okay, well, I'll be to the Penn Museum in a minute. Maybe I'll just come back. And he said, well, we'll just be there. And I said, okay, I'll come back. So I left Cat on the one side of the street, came across the street, again, not getting hit by a car, fortunately, up the stairs. I couldn't get into the, I tried to tap in again. Couldn't get in. I'm wondering, what's going on with my card? So I'm like, what am I going to do? I know they're going to be here or they're down there. I guess they were already down there. The train had pulled in and I couldn't get in. And I'm thinking I can't just yell to them to come up because they won't be able to hear me. It's a, it's like an L shaped. I'd have to walk straight and then hang a hard left, then go down the stairs. And I, I know that they definitely wouldn't hear me, especially if the train is there. Maybe once the train leaves, but at that point they might go out the other exit and, I'd be running all over looking to find them. So I thought, what am I going to do? I jumped the turnstile, but not in the cool way that you see in the TV or TV shows or movies. I kind of propped myself up, sat on the one side, threw my legs over. It was kind of like I was getting into the hot tub or a pool or something. Or something. And I walked away, and I was hoping that there was video. And I, I, I'll tell you in a second, I talked to somebody at SEPTA, and I said that. I said, is there a video? Could you, you think you could pull that? And I'll tell you that in a minute. So I go downstairs, down to the platform. I get the two guys who are there, Jim and Mark, and we walk back up the stairs. And then we cross the street to Cat, and then we go to the museum. There was no one else in the station. I don't know if the other folks who had gotten off Jim and Mark's train had already gone But there was nobody else in the station. There wasn't like I could say to somebody, oh, we'll just follow you out or I'll follow you out. Fortunately, going out, it wasn't a big deal because both Jim and Mark had to tap out. And the way, and I should mention this, the way that the regional rails work, you have a key card, you tap in when you get get to the station. It's easier at the center city stations because you can't get to the platform without tapping in. At all the different stations along the way, at Swarthmore and Rose Valley and Crumlin and places like that, you can't, there are these little tiny kiosks that if it's a new station, for example, when I slept on the way home from the uh, vending over the summer and I got off at Rose Valley, I couldn't find <laughs> the little kiosk because it's very it's very narrow and the size of the place that you put your card is maybe the size of an iPad mini. So to find this, it basically looks like a, like a post with uh, a screen on it. So at, at the stations along the line that aren't in Center City, that's how it is. So it's, it's easier getting off and on in Center City because, you know, you can't go through, you got to go through turnstiles and that's the only way you can do it. If you're in the 
along the route, you got to find the thing. So you tap in, they then scan your card on the train, and then you tap out at the other end. That's how that works. And fortunately, they have that handicap turnstile. And I hate to call it a turnstile because it's basically like a double glass door that opens up and you walk through. It's wide enough for a wheelchair, obviously. So that was no problem leaving. And I thought, if anybody else comes, I'm going to have to hop the turnstile again to get them. And that they were the last two. So it was only three people this time. Sometimes it's as many as five or six. Sometimes I not only help the people from the station, but some people get left at the front of the museum, right on South Street, right across from Franklin Field. And I go and I help them either through the museum if they've made their way to the museum, because the museum sits back. It's not right up against South Street. There's a there's an outdoor section and there's a um, there's a pool with a fountain, and so it's not right up against the street. It's not like they could get out of the cab or the CCT or the Uber and just figure, oh, I can just walk in those doors right over there. No, you got to come up some stairs and go this way and that way and around the around the fountain and then to the front door. And then once you're in the museum, it's another obstacle course, especially the one gallery that you have to walk through. It is not a straight shoot through this gallery. There's little jut outs, and we all know how I do <laughs> with little jut outs. Uh, I, I still haven't gotten all the bills from Pittsburgh yet, but that's another story. <laughs> so, so that's what I do a lot during the meeting. And on top of that, I give my treasurer's report and sometimes talk about some other things. And again, I don't mind doing it. I love helping the folks out. I also love walking through the museum, other than that one gallery where there's all sorts of obstacles. I tweeted at SEPTA on Monday morning, telling them I had to jump the turnstiles at the Penn Medicine Station, hoping that, oh, he jumped the turnstiles. Sounds like a real badass. <laughs> Figuring they would respond. That's against the rules. Da, 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 da. I got no response. And usually SEPTA is good about responding, so I was disappointed. So I then called the main number, and it was just after noon, I forget what day, one day during the week. And the person I got to said, I, I don't know really what to tell you, but you could call the accessibility department and you have to call the CCT line to talk to the accessibility department. So I waited until after 1 p.m. because they take lunch from, a, from noon to 1. And I got one person and this guy was not very helpful. His name was Lou. And after I talked to Lou... I then got Tina, and Tina was really helpful. And I, I told her the whole story, and I actually had her laughing. It was kind of funny. And she's the one I asked if there was videotape of – I'm sorry. I don't think anybody uses videotape anymore. If there was video <laughs> of the of that time, and I said it was right around 10 o'clock, 10, 15 on Saturday morning. And she said there probably is. I said, boy, I'd love to get a copy of that because it wasn't very graceful the way I went over. <laughs> and she started laughing. And I said, well, what can I do? What can I do? Well, she said, what's the matter with your card? I said, my card worked for the first person, but then it didn't work again. I couldn't get out of the station, unfortunately. I, just like I explained to you, I told her that the person I was with tapped out on the handicap turnstile so we could both walk through it. And she said, oh, I understand now. Well, go to the ticket booth. And I said, there's no one at the station. And the ticket booth for this station is on the other side of the turnstiles. So I'm not quite sure how that all worked out when they figured out, hey, we're going to make, <laughs> we're going to put this ticket booth here and then put the turnstiles here. I don't know why they did that. I, and again, it's before the, the key cards came out and everything else. On the non-paying side of the turnstiles, there are some kiosks where you can buy your ticket to get onto the train. I don't know how accessible they are. The one time I tried, I could not use them before I had the key card. Or my key, I guess my key card was bad. Fortunately, there was somebody, another passenger that helped me out uh, with that. So Tina told me there's usually a call box near the ticket booth. And I said, again, the ticket booth is on the wrong side. I'd have to jump the turnstile, so it doesn't even matter. If I'm in the station, I don't need to call anybody. And she said, all right, well, maybe by the kiosk, there's a call box. And so the next time I go, I'm interested to see if there is a call box around those kiosks, because if I get somebody on that, they can either do something with my card or allow me to walk through, open the handicap 
turnstile so I could walk through. And I told her I, I didn't have a problem jumping the turnstile. I'm sure it's a liability issue because if I slip and fall and hurt myself, which is highly likely, <laughs> even as graceful as I was going over, it would it could still I could catch my foot on the turnstile thing or and then trip and face plant or hurt my knee landing on them, whatever. So she said, yeah, she didn't advise doing that all the time. And I, I, I get it. But again, I have to help my friends get from the platform to the museum for the meeting. I have a funny Ziggy story for you. And this actually just happened this morning. I get up and I usually take a little space heater into the bathroom and turn it on and leave it on for 15, 20 minutes to warm the bathroom up. Our bathroom is ice cold. And especially to me, everything is ice cold, <laughs> is ice cold to me. So I usually put the heater in there and either go downstairs and talk to Liz, which I did today, but it was, again, pretty chilly in our house this morning. So we went back up into the bedroom, Liz, Ziggy, and I, and I got under the covers and Ziggy's wandering around the room and he doesn't always come into our bedroom because usually we keep the door shut, but he loves coming in there. He loves going into the hampers with the dirty clothes and he loves doing all that stuff. He loves getting clean clothes and he loves carrying them around. He wags his tail. He's always so happy. Liz had left the bedroom to go into the bathroom and I see Ziggy in the corner. The next thing I see is something white in his mouth. And I tell him to drop it, and he doesn't drop it. He eats it. And I said to Liz, and at that point, Liz had come back in, and and she said, what was it? I said, it looked like a tissue to me, but, you know, A, I can't see very well, and B, I'm across the room, so it makes it even less likely of me IDing what just went into him. And we're hoping it's not a sock. I said, could it be a tissue from the trash can? She said it could. Now, let me explain our trash cans. A few months ago, Ziggy got into our bathroom upstairs, which we, again, usually keep all the doors upstairs closed so we can't get in. But he got into the bathroom and immediately goes for the trash can because he loves tissues, used or new. <laughs> and he will start to eat them. So who knows what's el- what else is in that trash can. So in our kitchen, we have a big trash can, a kitchen-sized trash can, that has a lid on it that you step on it, and it opens up, and you throw the trash in, which has been great for him. He can't get in there. Perfect. It's a little taller than he is, so even if I'm standing on it, he'd have to crane his neck up a little bit, and the trash can would have to be full for him to get something off the top. We decided to buy something similar for the bathroom. So that if we don't close the door, then maybe the only thing he's going to eat is the toilet paper off the roll, which I don't think he's done that yet. But one of his brothers or sisters did that, and they posted a video, and it was hysterical because they're running out of the bathroom and around the corner. So there's this trail of toilet paper. We don't want that for Ziggy, though. Liz sees two different types of trash cans. Both of them are cylindrical. One is at BJ's. One was at Amazon. It was so tiny We ended up getting it and then sending it back. It came when I was in Pittsburgh, and it was just so small. The one at BJ's was bigger, and it was a two-pack. And I'm thinking, oh, that's great. We could put one in our our bedroom and one in the bathroom. So we did that. We've had them in there a couple of months. Got them, I don't know, sometime in November, December. I don't remember. Well, today, after Ziggy had that white thing in his mouth, we thought, could he have opened... Oh, and I was on the phone with Jane at that moment, too. She was having trouble with TD Bank and at the bank. And I said, could he have opened the trash can and gotten that out of there? And Liz is like, oh, no, he couldn't have done that. And I said, well, let's watch him. And he's watching us watch him. And when he thinks we're not looking, he goes and he opens it again. He knows to step on the little thing (laughs) down at the bottom, and that opens the lid, and he can get in there. And thinking about it and wondering why he never did it for the kitchen, the kitchen one would be too difficult, like I mentioned, because it's so much taller. And there would have to be something right at the top. Now, when it's very full, he has gotten corn husk that was kind of sticking out because when the top closed, maybe there was a little bit of it sticking out. And and he loves corn, so he loves corn husk, too. And he loves any kind of leaves, so... (laughs) In fact, that was during, during this week, uh, Liz and Jacob had BLTs one day for dinner. There was maybe half a head of iceberg lettuce left. That was his treat when he would come back in from going out to go to the bathroom or 
doing something good, we give him a little hunk of iceberg lettuce, which he loves. It's crazy. <laughs> so that's why he can't get into the kitchen one because it's taller. But these other ones, so we don't – now they have come off the floor. Well, at least the one in our bedroom has come off the floor because we still try to keep the bathroom door closed. And like I said, we allow him to come into the bedroom when we're in there. And he likes to jump on the bed and he grabs the dirty clothes. And uh, he's now trying to figure out – we have three hampers. One has – jeans and t-shirts and shirts in general. One has whites, mostly socks, turtlenecks, if Liz wears white turtlenecks. And then one has socks and underwear. Because he loves the socks and underwear most, I don't know why, but because of that, we have put the whites on top of the socks and underwear. So it kind of kind of pancakes down on top of it so you can't get to the other. He's trying, and I maybe one day he'll figure it out. I said to him after he opened the trash can if he wanted to go over to the bank to see if he can get into the vault. He, he did perk up when I said that, but I'm not sure he knew what I meant. So that is the funny Ziggy story. White Canes Connect episode 61, if it's not out by the time you're listening to this, will be out very shortly. We talked to Sean Calloway, who is the National Federation of the Blind of the District of Columbia president, also the president of Noble, the National Organization of Blind Black Leaders. And it's a Black History Month show that we found out more about Noble and what the organization hopes to do moving forward. It was a really good episode. Sean is a really good guy. We had him on White Canes Connect a while back, right before the 2021 convention, state convention in Harrisburg. And uh, the one thing that I was disappointed that we didn't ask him, nothing to do with Noble or any NFB stuff, during the convention, he had lost a bet to someone earlier, not during the convention, but during the convention, if it wasn't a, if it wasn't a very serious moment, he had an Eagles hat on with his suit and tie and everything. And it was just funny that he, <laughs> that he had that on. Even after everything was done, when everybody was in the bar at the hotel, he still had the Eagles hat on. And we talked about that. But we didn't talk about that during this episode. And I'm disappointed because obviously the Eagles were in the Super Bowl, if you didn't know. And they lost, if you didn't know. Sorry if I spoiled that. You were going to watch it later. I apologize. But that is episode 61 of White Canes Connect. In last week's episode, I guaranteed that episode 60 was going to be out last weekend. Well, you know when it was out? Tuesday morning at about 1 a.m. So I guaranteed that it would be out over the weekend. And so I will not make any more guarantees. Some other things had come up and there was an issue with something in the episode that I had to fix. So that delayed me getting the episode out. But episode 61, I am about three quarters of the way done editing it. If it doesn't drop today, Saturday, it will drop Sunday. Of course, if it doesn't drop Sunday, it'll drop Monday. (laughs) It'll drop soon, though. Episode 61. And like I mentioned earlier, episode 62, which will be next week's episode, will have another Black History Month show with Paul Howard and Chris Crawley. And we talked to both those guys yesterday. And kind of at two different ends of the spectrum. Paul has been around for quite a while. He's been in the NFB since 1975. And obviously, so he's seen a lot of things go on. And Chris is relatively new. He's only been in the NFB about 10 years. And just getting both of their perspectives, they talk a little bit more about Noble. And one thing that will stick in my mind that Chris said, he is getting ready to move. He's currently living in South Carolina with his wife and kids. They are moving to Arizona, and he mentioned when they move, they're moving on, I think he said this coming Wednesday, and he said, think of me in the airport with the two kids or three kids, I forget how, I think it was three kids, and a pregnant wife. And I said, I'm not going to be thinking about you when you're in the airport. I'm going to be thinking about you when you're locked on that plane and there's no place to go. (laughs) And that just reminded me of a friend of a friend who flew by himself when he had two little girls. Um, years ago, and I thought that was the bravest thing I ever heard. (laughs) So again, episode 61 of White Canes Connect will drop shortly. 62 with Paul and Chris will drop in about a week. And just check it out. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the places that you usually find your podcast, and maybe someday on whitecanesconnect.com. As I mentioned at the top, Just Listen was going to be a clip from the movie Revolution, not a clip with the audio described track because this was just the first take of that to get our feedback of what 
they should do more of and what they should do less of. And one thing that I can talk about that I didn't talk about the audio description earlier, it's tough when you have to squeeze some things in there. And the movie Revolution that we were watching, that giving the feedback on the audio described track, there are not a lot of breaks where you can say what's on the screen. And sometimes that makes it trouble for somebody who's blind or visually impaired wondering, hey, what is on the screen right now? Because this person who's doing the narration is just going on and on and on. So I don't know what sighted folks are seeing. And for the most part, and I I actually listened without watching. uh, I watched it twice because I wanted to get both perspectives. I, I watched it the first time without looking at it. And then I watched it the second time and looked at the screen and tried to figure out what I was seeing on the screen. So it's not an easy thing to squeeze in. You might only have six seconds. And I I think less than five or six seconds, you really shouldn't try and shoehorn something in there. But it's interesting to hear the described track because in films and TV and things like that, they're scripted. When we talked about the audio description with some of the theater folks the other day, one of the theater companies, and I think it was called 1812 Productions or something like that, they do improv. (laughs) So you can't have a script for that. You kind of have to do, it's kind of like play by play for the theater. So you've got to get somebody who can think quickly and then describe it in a short amount of time because there may be dialogue at any moment. So it's kind of tough in that instance of getting it, getting it right. So unfortunately, I don't have Just Listen this week. If I can play it next week, I will. Hopefully, I'll have that. Or maybe if I can't, I will wait for the final product with the audio description. And then I can play and you can hear the describer's style, if you will. And hopefully, Lisa will get on it because I'm telling you, she would be great at it if she can just... The issue with doing any kind of voiceover work when you're blind or visually impaired, and I think I've talked about this before... If you can't read the words that are on a screen or on a paper and you don't know Braille, which both Lisa and I do not know, you've got to listen to what you have to say using the script, using your screen reader on your computer or your phone, and then repeating it. And sometimes the trouble with some of the screen readers, they they say a word that may not be pronounced correctly. For example, my phone always says Nice for the word N-I-C-E, like the city in France. Maybe it knows I want to go there. So you have to be careful about that, especially with names. And so that makes it a little tricky, but you have to get it down so you're not starting and stopping. You can just listen and repeat and say it if it's a regular voiceover, not an audio description. If it's a regular voiceover, you have to add some some life to it. If it's an audio described track that you're doing, it really doesn't have to be any kind of personality into it. People just want to know what's going on. What do the sighted folks see? Is there a gun on the table that Joe is slowly reaching for? That's all you need to know. It's not, oh my God, there's a gun on the table. Joe's going to go for it. It's, there's a gun on the table and Joe slowly reaches for it. That's all. I will play the finished product if I can, if I get a copy of that. And I hope I do, because, again, I'd love to let you hear uh, the way it's described. That is all I have for you this week for I Can't See You, episode 219. Please reach out. You can reach out on the socials at David Benj, D-A-V-I-D-B-E-N-J, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And remember, you can also listen to the episodes over on YouTube, like Ziggy does when we go out. Sadly, we don't go out enough, so he might be behind an episode or two. You can also reach out to me via email, I can't see you podcast at gmail.com, I can't see you podcast at gmail.com. And of course, there is the phone number where you can give me a buzz and leave up to three minutes of questions, comments, show ideas, what you like, what you hate what you want more of, what you want less of. The number is 646-926-6350. You have up to three minutes. Please leave your name in town if you do leave a voicemail. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know anything you've got to tell me, anything. Please reach out, 
1-800-273-5050. Thank you so much for listening to episode 219 of I Can't See You. Show notes are over on the website, icantseeyou.com slash 219, icantseeyou.com slash 219. Remember, I Can't See You sounds like a whole sentence. It's only seven characters long. I C A N T C U dot com slash two hundred nineteen. Thanks again for listening. Be well, stay safe, and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the I Can't See You podcast with David. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. And don't forget to share the podcast with your friends.